Hello everyone, good evening. A very warm and pleasant welcome to another great event of the CA Singapore chapter. Valuation of the startups and case study on valuation. I, Manisha Jain, on behalf of CA Singapore chapter, would like to greet and thank all of you, our dear CA members, for being present and gracing this occasion. Just a quick check. Please ensure that your phones are in silent mode. Hearing the word startups itself creates excitement and a thought revolving around innovation. And here are we discussing about their valuation, which is going to be extremely priceless. We have eminent speakers, our dear CA members, CA Gandhar J, CA Amrish Gar, partners of Finvox Analytics LLP, an international corporate finance firm offering valuation and analytical support services with offices in New York, our present country, Singapore, and our very own Gurugram. The event also has a very special guest, our dear CA member, CA Dr. Raj Kumar Adukia, Central Council member. <laughs> Being very excited about the event, now let us move forward. I would like to call upon the stage, our dear chairperson, Ramki sir, for a few words. Good evening everyone. Thank you, Manisha. Am I audible, guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall I switch the presentation? Yeah, you can. So firstly, uh, good evening, dear members. It's a pleasure to see you all again. Um, let me begin by extending a warm welcome to our special guest this evening. Uh, as Manisha pointed out, uh, CA uh, Rajkumar Adityaji, Ji, our Central Council member. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. We're indeed uh, very glad to have you here with us. Our speakers for the evening uh, come from Delhi, Gandharv and Amrish. Warm welcome. Thank you. What I'll quickly do for the sake of members, as usual on every event, we give a quick update. So please allow me to do that. We've been having series of events every month. As members, you must be aware of the professional events, the knowledge series, as well as the social events. And that uh, continues month on month. Maybe you can just go into the next slide. A quick reminder on our World Congress of Accountants on 18th to 21st of November in Mumbai. A lot of information is available on the ICI website. I think we keep circulating. Neerja keeps updating us on what's happening. The number of delegates are going to be more than five, 6,000, and the who's who both from India as well as internationally, are going to be speakers in the event. I think it's a great event to learn, to contribute, to network. So do consider coming there. Um, moving on, I think you must have seen that we made a professional courtesy visit to our Indian High Commission's office and met Mr. P. Kumran this morning. Uh, we had It was a courtesy visit. We also invited him for the Diwali event. I think uh, he's certainly extremely keen. Uh, however, he may have a CII event, so he's just trying to figure out how to manage his calendar, and we'll soon get to know. We were also discussing uh, collaborations and initiatives with Indian High Commission. Apart from that, the mutual recognition agreement and the memorandum of understanding with Institute of Singapore Chartered Accountants. And he was also sharing with us that the government of India, through the Indian High Commission, is talking to various professional bodies. He was giving an example of how there was a shortage of nurses in India and I believe there were only six or seven nursing institutes of India that were approved in Singapore. You know, so there's that whole uh, engagement of the Indian High Commission as well in important matters. Because even I was wondering how come the Indian High Commission is going to be involved in mutual recognition agreement, but I was pleasantly surprised that they're also willing to play a part in helping us. And I did inform uh, His Excellency that <coughs> our president, as well as vice president of our parent body were here in July. So the talks with ISCA are on in the right trajectory. We've had some meetings, so we look forward to taking that further. Now, as far as our events are concerned, uh, we have uh, a series of events in October as well as next month. Uh, we start with the event today for the startup valuation. We have a social event organized by Vikas uh, on the Rain Corridor. So do sign up and come. Uh, on October 12th, we have a joint event with CT Australia on digital innovation and fintech landscape. I think a lot of you must have seen the 
flyer on WhatsApp. And that's going to be another interesting session. And that's followed by the much-awaited Deepavali Gala event at Gen Tanglin by Shangri-La. And the registrations are on. Please do sign up. It's going to be quite unique and memorable. I already spoke about WCOA, World Congress of Accountants. And uh, as of now, we have confirmation on a professional leader, Mr. Saurabh Mukherjee, who is an investment guru. A lot of you must have heard him over the webinar a year ago. And I remember when we uploaded that on the YouTube, we had over 50,000 views. So we had a webinar. So he's going to be here in Singapore and you know, it'll be a pleasure. So that's a quick update on the events that are lined up for the next couple of months. This, of course, is just to make sure that everyone gets into the zone, gets into the mood. Um, so if some of your friends and colleagues need a bit of a nudge and a prod, uh, please do that because uh, capacity is not infinite, it's finite. So my dear office bearers and MC members will let me know that you know we need to get the registrations going fast. So this is going to be the much awaited event on the 5th of November. Great. So with that, uh, once again, warm welcome to all of you, as well as our esteemed guests. And let me pass it over to our vice chairperson, Solna. Thank you. Thank you, Ramki. Uh, just a quick update on membership and social media. Membership, we are very close to 400, um, just two short of 400. So that would be a great achievement uh, in terms of getting there. Uh, but we are not stopping there. Our 2023 target is to go to 500 plus and keep going from there. Uh, a quick update on the social media. So LinkedIn page, um, I'm sure you all are aware of existence of our LinkedIn page. So if you are not following us, please do follow us. You get the quick updates of events, what is happening, what is not happening, and so on. Uh, a quick uh, reminder that in terms of followership, before uh, we started this year around AGM April, we had close to 300 followers only on LinkedIn. Today we are sitting at 721, which is a great job. Uh, and all thanks to the events team, the membership, all the members coming in for the events, which we post on social media and which creates a lot of hype and people are attracted to our, our events. So, and then just to give you a snapshot of the last four events, um, if I recall correctly, you know, I think last year when we had posted our LinkedIn page uh, updates, we would receive um, 200 or 300 views. Now, if you look there closely, the first box, the first event, the last event, which was the ESG event, that has 4,600 impressions. Um, one before that, the bowling one has 5,500 plus impressions. The event before that, which was the navigating the post-pandemic, this was internal members event, that has gotten 10,000 plus impressions. And the one with our chair, um, president and vice president, that has got 11,000 plus views. So this is actually pretty impressive, and uh, as I mentioned every time, Ramki and I both are firm believers of social media. I think if we, you know, it, it has got magic. So if we, if we just use that uh, as a tool to engage and attract more members, I'm sure we'll be there. Moving on to the next page, uh, a quick update on a few other initiatives that, as a chapter, we are uh, taking on, and we will seek interest. If anyone is interested to come forward and volunteer help, please do come forward. Um, the first one is election subcommittee. So we had our formal meeting of the election subcommittee recently. This is the subcommittee that was launched at the time of AGM to draw up a framework for uh, MC elections going forward, starting from 2024. Um, and we have sent an email with invitations. Whoever is interested, please come forward and join the subcommittee. We have received uh, a few interests so far, so we will we'll still wait until the end of this week, and then we'll formally close the invitations for the uh, subcommittee. Uh, sponsorships, that is another thing that as a committee this year, we are putting a lot of stress on. Um, we are reaching out to many corporates, startups, uh, banks, etc., just to you know, get funds for us so that there is less, less stress on our um, budget or on our exchequer, so to say. Um, if you have any, any sort of um, 
you know, source or anything that you can think of will be a good potential for sponsorship for us, just reach out to us, send an email, just drop us a, a WhatsApp message, we will do the rest, we'll, we'll go and reach out to them. And if you are keen to help us with that, most welcome. We need more hands. Um, social events, as Ramki mentioned, we are uh, trying to engage more members via you know, social events, hikes, bowling, etc. So please join those events. The next one is on 9th October. Um, another important point is the website refresh. We are trying to put in a little bit of resources there, uh, trying to see if we can you know, ramp up the website, the look and feel of it, just so that it becomes more um, recent and more attractive. Um, so again, if anyone has any interest, has done anything on website update, please come forward and you know, we'll be happy to uh, take your assistance, your experience. Uh, another thing is uh, members profile survey. Now, we have kind of a rough idea what our member base is like you know, in terms of um, age range or experience range or industry range, etc. But we are trying to come up with a survey which we will launch, let's say, in another a month or so, wherein we will get the exact details and then we'll come up with, uh, let's say, a profile, a one-pager profile, which will give us a nice snapshot of, you know, what are the experience range of our members? What industries do we work in? Um, what are the positions that we hold in the companies and so on and so forth? Which will be a very nice um, one-pager to show to, let's say, an external agency like the High Commission we went to today. So this is more like, you know, give, give them a feel of what our membership base is like. The last point is the 2023 membership renewal, which is coming up soon. So what we will do is uh, towards the end of the year, let's say around December, we'll roll out more information to you. Uh, and then, you know, we'll we need your support to come forward and you know, to keep continue the relationship as, as is. So that's all on the mem membership and other updates. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Quite a lot of new members joining and we hope we meet our 400 target very soon. Now, proceeding, thank you once again all of you for taking out time and joining this evening. This evening would be a great success owing to you. Now let us call upon our Central Council Member, CA Dr. Raj Kumar Adukia, Global Life and Business Transformation Guru, author of more than 300 Global Life and Business Transformation Guru, author of more than 300 books with a passionate mission to transform CA profession, make every citizen economically powerful and India the most powerful nation of the world. He was a member of IFAD PAIB committee from 2001 to 2004, member of IFRS SMEIG London from 2018 to 20, and ex-director of SBI Mutual Fund BOI Mutual Fund, Global Mediator, International Arbitrage. He was an author of seven books on IFRS India's. Winner of National Book Honours Award 2018. That deserves an applause. <laughs> He's also a member of International Bar Association, served as President of GST Research Foundation, Vice President of India Insolvency Professional. There is so much more to it, and this is just a synopsis. I would like our, our chairperson, Ramki sir, to felicitate Rajkumar sir. chapter Ramki and uh, you know Koinu diamonds in the Singapore chapter managing committee Nija, Somnath, Nishan, Manisha and thanks for the nice words which you spoke about me. I am one of the family member not a guest because I am part of the profession and more so I am a council member. 
so a larger responsibility as a family member how the profession is going ahead how the members are should be like a startup you know why the name startup from the beginning itself they are up in the business we don't say business up so thanks uh, to the chapter you know they informed me earlier the event was put i am here to attend the conference of ivsc international valuation standard council taking place day after tomorrow so then you know we coincide uh, you know we can meet the members of the chapter i am thrilled to see the activities with the chapter is doing and uh, actual number of members residing here maybe 1800 so we need to muster up you know that they because the biggest asset in the world is contact in the various regional language we can have the equivalent like in gujarati i say because then it a rhythm sauthi moti khan ol khan what a contact can do any amount of money cannot do another thing i would like to talk is that everything happens twice first in the mind of the person whatever has happened in this world second time when it actually happens so if i am meeting here with each one of you it is second time first time you know when rakhi and myself we spoke you know that okay we'll have a chapter meet then nisan said you know like i had scheduled a fourth at kl because since it's so like a inter twin city like we have hyderabad sikandrabad or noida gurugram so this is one then the president vice president they visited i think one and a half month back they spoke about world congress world congress happens once in four years and this is the 21st world congress so in almost last 100 years first time happening in india and singapore is so close by to india and more than 6000 already 3500 physical registration 1000 uh, virtual registration is taken please and the fees may be known to you is uh, about 324 us dollar for uh, physical registration and 24 us dollar about virtual registration so what we get at the conference like i qualified in 1983 and i got married in 1986 why i am mentioning the year of marriage is till i got married the 100% of my receipt 100% of my income was spent on conferences and books <clears throat> and the learning from the conferences learning of the contacts like today gandharva and amrit they are speaking so we are by looking at them if we feel that they looks like us two hand two leg or uh, two eyes <laughs> why can't we be valuation expert like them <laughs> if there were global projects on valuation having offices in each continent so we emulate when we attend conferences and hear all regional bodies of the world kapa sapa ipec edinbara group there are about 15 of them so their members are also having sideline meeting so we will have an occasion to see the whole world what is the profession and one may get lot of ideas my mission is that each member who is an employment should become ceo the corner cabin and the one who is in practice should be a global practitioner and i have made seven uh, alphabet acronym pmi prime minister india op narendra modi likes online payment you know all digital payments and then uh, pv connected with valuation present value so what is p p is a passion what is passion like 
if we work for 10 hours, after working for 10 hours, we will get a thrill to work for 30 hours. After working for 30 hours, we will like to work for 100 hours. So find out our passion, you know, like what the job, the activity which we are doing, like Ramki, he is a passion, you know, chapter, he has lined up the activities. So then we get more pleasure and is a mindset, a positive mindset of growth and uh, like what happens in the startup. The valuation before it has commenced, even if it is making losses in the balance sheet, the valuation is very high, maybe 500 times uh, what the book says. Then I is the income, you know, the, we get enthusiasm when there is an income. So whatever passion we are following, whatever thing we want to do, it should have active income and passive income. So three alphabet I have covered PMI. Then OP, online payment. O, the opportunities, like I was listing down, there are about 25 plus global opportunities, like this valuation is a global opportunity, forensic is a global opportunity, corporate governance is a global opportunity, the CSR is a global, so like that we can have with the biggest skill of a chartered accountant is professional skepticism. This terminology comes in the auditing standards. Like my wife uh, keeps on complaining, you know, why I am inquiring so many things, where she has gone and what she has done. I say the fault lies with the CA profession, you know, in my blood. <laughs> so professional skepticism is Enquiring attitude, like we will enquire, you know, why those chairs are empty, you know. Uh, so, the everything can be an opportunity, like there can be an internal audit of events like this. So, and P is a what Somnath is for. Pajans, in Hindi we say, Jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. So, presence of two types, you know, when I said present value, the physical presence, like today I am here in the chapter, so I may be known as a council member Rajkumar Adukia, but once you come physically, okay, this guy is Rajkumar Adukia. So, every chamber of commerce, like Amriz and Gandhav, they are making a physical presence. Finvox is known globally, you know, it's a number one valuation company. So, we should make our physical presence in whatever form we can do. There are so many platforms to make uh, presentations to, and then we is a virtual presence. This social media is so powerful as we know that 60% uh, of the world uses, and this is one media or one kind of presence where without spending a single penny, what we need to invest is in our time. So none of the platform is a plate, paid platform like FB, LinkedIn, uh, have YouTube channel. In fact, they give a lot of income once we, and in our code of ethics, whether in employment or in practice, do not have any bar on use of social media because what we are doing is we are sharing our pure knowledge on social media. So I would like each one of you, like we at the institute, do a lot of webinars. I have a great passion of webinars. So every day, Monday to Friday, we have webinars, virtual webinars. So I am heading about four committees. One is how to make firms global. Then there is a continuing professional education committee, so which is like a whole world, whole planet, any subject we do a webinar in that. Then third is again a very potent, a committee on economic and commercial laws and economic advisory. So there also the canvas is very big. And the fourth is more connected with knowledge, central distribution system, how all publications uh, becomes online, all uh, webinar recordings are available to the members. So please reach out to us. In fact, we, 
when we offer ourselves as a council member like when ramki somnath they have offered for a chapter activities they have all the time you know you pick up uh, uh, you dial them they will reply immediately you whatsapp to them same way the council members have volunteered they have a patient to interact with the members so if something is not happening some uh, membership issue other things the thumb rule should be it should happen on its own and it should happen at the click of the button singapore is one example you know i have been studying whenever i go to a country i study the economy re study i have visited the here earlier six, six times so i re studied you know how it it is an asian tiger how e eodb ease of doing business is number 2 how the corruption transparency uh, transparency index is very high what this country has done and i was writing to the chapter office bearers what we can learn in india from this country in terms of ease of doing business like i am meeting tomorrow singapore international arbitration center which is one of the very prominent uh, center in asia and uh, globally also yesterday i was at uh, asia international arbitration center in kl so how india we can uh, replicate and learn from uh, best practices so i will not take much time of each one of us including mine because i am also very eager to listen uh, gandharva and amrish because i talked to them before i came here so like bluetooth technology their knowledge uh, gets you know spread and known to us i would like to sum up my address by inviting each one of you for connecting with us letting us know your passion what you wish to do in what area you want to be known in the world and you will see that we won't be lacking we if you give 10% of the effort we will be giving 100% of the effort in that direction i personally commit for that because i have that passion for uh, in each colleague and the reason is in the process i learn so i invite each one of you to write a book on a subject of your passion it may be a professional it may be a non professional it may be a general and i want each one of you to become a speaker all these abilities are within us it is like an app you know any app which we have unless we download and start using we don't know the power of that app so when we took a birth the app is already downloaded in our mind like we have a brain which is hardware and mind is a software so i have done a study on mind uh, the mind chemicals positive chemicals dopamine uh, serotonin and endorphin and so i would like each one of us each one of you to increase those positive chemicals and unleash the power within each one of us and i wish singapore chapter a great success it's already number 1 and uh, to reach a greater height uh, with all team members together everyone achieves more so those who want a home hospitality they can connect with me so uh, we can uh, make the arrangement i will see that the best of the facility is available this is my personal assurance apart from you know what assurance icai is giving thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir we'll definitely use our apps more <laughs> thank you now proceeding to the much awaited speakers see gandharv jain fca and cpa usa a registered valuer with more than 15 years of experience in fundraising mna advisory valuations assurance diligence 
restructuring services. Thank you so much, Gandharv, for joining and sharing knowledge. And our next speaker, CA Amrish Gar, FCA, CFA USA, registered valuer, again a very professional experienced professional, more than 15 years of experience in fundraising, transaction support services, business valuation, purchase price allocation, complex instruments valuation. We have a lot of learning this, this evening. Thank you, esteemed members, for coming up and sharing our knowledge. After the event, we'll have question and answer session. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to start with thanking the ICAI Singapore chapter for inviting me and Amrish to present here. It's a great opportunity. And as we have come here, we see that uh, this is a very dynamic team. I am very impressed by the way that you guys are leading ICAI Singapore chapter, the kind of activities that you are doing and the amount of time that you guys are spending. I had a very limited interaction with uh, Rajiv. I came here in 2019 and I think Rajiv was the chairman at that point in time. So we had a very limited interaction on what ICI Singapore chapter is doing, but today coming here and seeing that uh, the way that you guys are leading this is amazing. So uh, I, my congratulations to Ramki, the entire uh, managing committee members, Anuradha, Raji, Nishant, everybody here. Uh, very happy uh, Durga Puja to all of you. Today is Durga Puja, so I think we have come at a festive time. It's a good time to come in. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, CA Dr. Rajkumar Dukia ji for his kind words that he spoken about us. We had a very good interaction. In fact, we met, he was saying that everybody meets twice. We met him at the lunch, coincidentally today. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the second time we're meeting him today. So, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we are here to present uh, on the valuation of uh, startups. And uh, this session, I think uh, we have designed it in a way that we want to keep it very engaging. Uh, there are a lot of case studies, examples that uh, would be coming up. Both me and Amrish will try to tell you how we look at these startups from our angle. We have been in this profession for the last 15 years. I started my career with Ernst & Young in 2007 in the corporate finance and then with uh, Crystal S&P and then uh, with KPMG before me and Amrish joined hands in 2015 and started Finbox. Uh, we started Finmox as an outfit uh, to serve the global valuation profession and as a first trip we, we went to US searching for work. We didn't have even a single meeting, but we still went. So, see okay. Rajkumar Adhukyaji to answer to you. So, we, that was the kind of uh, passion that we had that, okay, let us, let us make it a global profession. Yes. In India, valuation was not as popular at that point in time in 2013-14. It was only after 2016 that IBC has come in, insolvency in bankruptcy code had come in that uh, valuation profession has gained prominence. But uh, we thought that uh, we would be the be the torch bearers and we'll try and bring this profession to the global forum within India. So as I speak to you today, uh, we have a presence in uh, US, Singapore, Middle East and India. And we do a lot of work uh, in US and uh, developed markets. And from there, we bring a lot of knowledge which help us in executing engagements in the developing economies like, uh, like India. And now with like developed, like I will say Singapore is developed, so we doing a lot of valuations here also where there are a lot of complex instruments that we are valuing warrants and uh, debentures and whole, whole what and not. So that's how we are structured. Uh, we have a 40, a 45 people team uh, delivery center in India. Uh, obviously we have kept, now we have kept satellite offices uh, in US and Singapore after COVID. Earlier we used to add some team also, now we are adding it back again so that uh, we can serve the clients in a better way. And the aim is to obviously uh, uh, have uh, uh, global uh, clients. Uh, we are currently serving a lot of global clients and Indian, large Indian clients also. So, so that's how we are structured. Um, so today, I think uh, uh, within the within this session, what we will be taking up is basically uh, I would be starting up uh, with uh, uh, maybe telling you more about the ecosystem of startups, how startups have evolved and. Uh, what where, where the current situation is and then i think amrish uh, will be uh, taking up uh, the valuation techniques both modern and uh, traditional valuation techniques and uh, he what we have what we have tried to do is that we have tried to make it in a way that we we tell everything to you by way of an example like uh, when we'll be uh, telling you about valuation techniques we'll be taking examples of uh, companies like bird uh, stanza living, we, we do valuation standard stanza living. So we will be trying then, uh, then once we have explained the valuation techniques, 
then uh, again I will be taking up case studies on Zomato and uh, uh, WeWork and is my trip. So we'll try and we'll try and demonstrate that how the entire ecosystem is uh, coming up. Obviously, we come from India, so a lot of examples will be coming in from India. So we have we have kept the theme as we'll take some examples from US, which is developed economy, and some examples from U from India, which is the third largest in terms of now startup ecosystem that we have uh, uh, globally. So that's how we are structured. Uh, and we wanted to be engaging. Don't don't wait for the Q and A session in case you've got any burning question which you can't hold on to yourself. Please stand up and ask. There's no problem in uh, breaking our momentum. That's not a problem with us. So you can just stand up and ask your question. I think uh, it is uh, always good to have an engaging session rather than just a monologue and then you come up with a question at the end. So in case you see something on the screen where you feel that you have to ask this question, just just bring it on. Right. So, uh, can I start? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, before I start, I would like to ask maybe a couple of you guys, what, what do you think is our startup? So, in your mind, when, when this word startup comes in, what, what anybody of you can stand up and tell us what, 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 what in your mind is startup? Anybody? You can volunteer and maybe say a couple of characteristics, tell a couple of characteristics that startups may have. I guess, uh, agile. <coughs> I guess I'll, I'll just go for it. Yeah, at least. Uh, a venture where somebody is looking to address an imperfection in his career. Yeah, absolutely correct. So, as as rightly said, I think. Uh, so uh, the unique solution that the startups are providing, and they are helping to eradicate a problem and recreate and distribute something that was already there or not there, right? That's what that's what generally a startup is, right? So we have to look at a startup more from that perspective that the money that is being spent to create a startup is being spent basically to create something which is not there, right? So so it's it's a young company which is trying to recreate and re and, and distribute something which was already there. Uh, so there are there are two sides of a startup. We we see that and typically when when any investor also invests in startup, they have got a mindset that okay, we'll invest in ten startups, maybe. Four will work, six will fail, right? But what happens? Why why startups fail and why some are good startups? So, a startup is usually a blend of the idea that is exciting, effective, and feasible, experienced mentors and resource managers, adaptable and purpose driven. Why some of them fail? Because they somewhere get lost in the purpose, right? So, like lack of persistence, quitting too early, running out of money or resources, too slow on pickup and late execution. Like you would be seeing, uh, uh, and I think we should be also talking about it when, when he will be uh, speaking. A lot of investors only give importance to the team. They would only want to invest in the team. They, they say that, okay, the idea is is okay. But if the team is there to execute that particular uh, idea, I think the startup would, would, would be able to sail through. right? So therefore, in a startup, both an idea and team are important. Uh, we all know some of the key characteristics, they are unique business models uh, and that is why it is very problematic, not problematic but very interesting and very exciting to value startups because you don't find any comparables, there are no benchmarks, right? So whether you have to value a startup at X or at Y or at Z is something that you have to decide based on your professional acumen, right? And that's where the experience comes in and that's where you have to open yourself to look at things which are beyond numbers, right? And that is what we will be talking all through the session today that you have to think beyond numbers. It is not only numbers that matters, there are, there are many other things which matter when you are looking at startups. Uh, there are multiple claims on equity. Any startup uh, brings in uh, uh, the uh, mature investors, like invest like Sequoia or Tiger or all of these investors invest in these startups. And uh, they have multiple claims like they, they will be investing in Series A, Series B, Series C. Every series will have its own rights, investor rights. Again, we'll be talking about that as well in detail. So, uh, difficult to survive. Some of them are difficult to survive. Commercial failures are there. And one thing which is very important to understand is that uh, till the startups are not made public, like recently we have started seeing the trend of startups going public, at least in India. Right. So, they went public in US, but in India we have started, started seeing, seeing the scene. They are very illiquid. So, do you, does anyone can tell me or here has got any understanding on how startup ecosystem evolved? Like what made this startup as an investment class? Yeah. 
right? We all say that okay, everybody today is investing in startups. We all know it's a high risk game, right? So as an asset class, uh, you would not want to invest in startup if you're not having that risk taking power. Right? But still, there's so much of money flowing in from uh, global sources and coming into startups. Uh, I would like to share interesting, sto interesting uh, like kind of a, uh, not a story, but a series of events which led to evolve of evolution of startups. But anybody here who can, who can maybe give some throw some light. Maybe somebody knows that how this entire ecosystem got built. What made this is a multi multi billion dollar industry venture capitals, and what made them believe that startups will give returns. A few right? success stories. Yes, a few success stories. That's correct. And we don't see that often, right? So in India, we're not seeing them. Like Zomato IPO mm -hmm. happened, it failed. Paytm happened, it failed. But still, money is coming in. There was a Nike. So, uh, Nike too, right? Right? Nike too. There was a. Is my trip too. So we'll we'll come to that as well. But but I'm saying way, that it is. It is way, all companies have been startup. You know, whether every company which has been in IPO, whether yeah. no, the term startup has come and evolved now, and people have started getting what to see. Reliance was a startup at some point of time and you actually got interested in it. So, so the definition of startup is always there. It's just now people have realized that there's a different class together now because the gestation period, the, the investment opportunity for investing in startups were not there as prominent as what we have now. Sure. Right? Because so much of companies have come in the market and make it easy for you to start up, invest in the startups. Yeah. So that's why it becomes an, a, a different class. But startup always exists, but they were always having a different sort of mechanism by which they were getting funded. You know, they yeah. were going to the banks, they were getting uh, funded from friends, families, or some investors, private equity. So some investors were always there. You know, that's why so many companies went for IPOs eventually. You know. But now there's a different ecosystem and different kind of investors which are helping startups to evolve. Correct. So maybe I just want to add. Yeah. One is of course a pain point or a business idea. The, on the other side is the availability of capital, private equity, private investments, pool of money, which has traditionally invested in real estate or equity. But this is another class of asset which probably has a slightly longer time horizon, but is able to fund entrepreneurs who have business ideas and who lack financial resources. And then there is an entry as well as an exit. So right. as an IRR or as a return during the journey, it probably is slightly superior, it's riskier, but if done well, is a superior return from an other asset class. So I think Ramki is spot on. So Rajiv was also uh, good, but I think Ramki has picked up well. So that's what is that's what I'll be coming up with. So see, everybody who we meet and we talk about startup is very intrigued about the fact that why there's so much money coming in, still startup is losing so much money, but still money is coming in, right? You see another round happening at a much larger valuation and much bigger money coming into that startup. So what is making that uh, uh, what is making that investor believe that that the startup ecosystem will survive and will give results, right? So I think, as Ramki correctly said, it is more about availability of capital, which plays a very very big role in the startup ecosystem, and more so in valuations also, right? So at some point in time, I think valuations become immaterial. So th so there is there are those investors who are investing in these startups, they are not investing for valuation. Right, economic ownership is in their hands, so they know that even if it's priced at hundred or it's priced at thousand, does not make a difference to them. So how it all started is that uh, somewhere in nineteen. So I'll take an example of U.S. because that is from where it all started, and then I'll take it, I'll, I'll tell you about the Indian ecosystem for the venture capital fund. So I'll keep it short because I think there's much more on the technical side which uh, uh, which have, we have to talk about also. So how it happened is that the family office like JP Morgan or Warburg or Rockefellers of the world started investing in the private companies in US, right? They were wealthy, wealthy uh, family offices. Uh, they had a lot of capital. They started investing uh, somewhere in 1945. Then 1945 to 70 in US, again, there was, an, there was some kind of regulatory act which came in which provided tax breaks to venture capital funds. And that is from where the venture capital became synonymous with the technology finance, right? Because Typically, the, the, the technology firm did not used to have any kind of collaterals to put to banks, right? So you do, you can go to banks and ask for money, but banks will always come back and tell you what you have to pledge, right? So that is something from where the venture capital as an asset class started. And then uh, I think uh, availability of uh, venture capital exploded. What happened is that in all of these uh, uh, 
venture capital funds like Sequoia uh, or other funds started coming into the Silicon Valley. How Silicon Valley term came in is that because there were semiconductor and computer companies who actually made a hub there and all of these venture capital funds started coming in. There was a formation of the National Venture Capital Fund Association. And what happened was that Sequoia and other same investors invested in Apple, right? And there was a trend of making the companies very quickly, the, the companies were taken to IPO in US. Like in India, we are seeing a Zomato has been taken to IPO after 13 years, right? That's not the case at that point in time. The companies used to come into play and in the two, three years they, they used to have an IPO. So what happened in the US is that uh, there was very, uh, there were successful IPOs like Apple, uh, which gave enormous returns to the venture capital funds and they gained confidence. And from there, startup investing became a popular asset class. Right, and after that, in 1990, all of these companies like what we hear today also, Amazon, Yahoo, AOL, Netscape, all of these companies came into play. And their IPOs again generated multi-fold returns to the venture capitals, right. And that is what uh, led to a rush of money of venture capital increasing the money committed to the sector from $1.5 billion in 1991 to $90 billion in 2000. Then the dot-com bubble happened. We all know about how that dot-com bubble happened, right? So all of the internet internet came into play in 1994, and dot-com bubble happened where every company who had a dot-com as a as a uh, web page used to get money. Whether they are selling uh, what I can say, <laughs> they are selling biscuits for dogs, or they are selling anything uh, or everything became. Uh, and then uh, the, the the crash came in. And after that only the world learned that it's not only about technology, venture capital can also get, get into the other classes of assets and to other geographies as well. And that's how the diversification of venture capital investments happened uh, outside of US and economies uh, like India and China got money from US investors. So if you see, uh, see here, this is the this is how it all started and it peaked somewhere in 20, 20, 2000 and then the dot com bubble happened and it came down. And then now again it is speaking. 2021, we all know COVID year. Uh, the COVID year, what happened was that again the dot com kind of bubble was formed where people thought that okay, we will never come back to the normal times and technology will always be a uh, role play. And uh, therefore, uh, there was a huge surge in the investments, both in terms of valuation, in terms of money, and everything. In 2022, we are seeing this decline. I'll, I'll show you through another example which we have taken right now. That is just United States. That's this is just United US, States. yeah. This is just US. You can see like three thirty billion dollars. Mm. It's massive. Oh, that's coming. Nobody is bothered about valuation. Let me tell you. In twenty twenty one, nobody is nobody is bothered about valuation. <laughs> so, yeah. So in India, what happened is that in nineteen eighty six, the venture capital industry was in infancy, and uh, from nineteen eighty six to nineteen ninety five, there was still government institutions, uh, but this IVCA came into play, like in US, NBCA came into play, and that is how the push came in. See, ultimately you have to understand the venture capital uh, managers also have to make their money, right? So they are getting capital. They also have to make the carry. There's a structure, right? 20, yeah. 220, people know it, right? Carry and all. So it's become it's become a professional, professional opportunity for a lot of people to take money from these wealthy families and put into the startups and give them returns, right? Like Sequoia and all. So from there also a lot of pushes coming in to pump money to the startup sector. So availability of capital plays a huge role. Then again from 2000 to uh, 1995 to 1999, they started taking interest in the Indian ecosystem. After the dot com bubble, when I told you that US had an eye opener that they can also look at other opportunities, is it money coming, started coming into India. And then uh, some of the aggressive venture capital funds like Tiger Global and Sequoia, I would say, that made or spoiled, whatever you can you want to call it, <laughs> the Indian market and the Indian startup ecosystem. And that is how it, it all started, right? And then uh, 16, again, there was a lack of clarity regarding exit, exits uh, made by investors. So what was happening between 2016 and 2020 in India is that there was no clarity on how the investors will be able to make the exit, right? The IPO rules were not very clear. SEBI had restrictions on loss-making companies going into IPOs. Right, so all of these investors who had put in so much of money were not very sure how exactly would they be able to make an exit. Whether the M and A would do the only be the only route of exit, or they can also get an IPO as an opportunity. Only when all of this lobbying happened, a lot of lobbying happened at SEBI. SEBI then eventually came out with a rule that okay, for four years you can still be non-profitable and you can be an IPO company. 
So that that generated a lot of confidence in the investor class, and then they start, started again putting in money. So in 2021, we all we all saw that uh, was a landmark year for startups and investors in India, both in terms of exits and fresh funding. And then now again, 2022, due to global meltdown, poor performance of public tech companies, global geopolitical issues, and a lot of other uh, physical uh, things coming back into play, there's another, another slowdown. So if you see here, this is the Indian startup ecosystem. <coughs> Uh, you can see the high here, right, and then a little well down here in 2022. So I think uh, the next, so this is the current global ecosystem where India is the third largest. And let me tell you, India is soon catching up with, soon catching up with China. Last year saw deals happening, more deals happening in India than China because of the, uh, again, the problems that China had. So I think, uh, I believe it's soon you will see India shooting up China as well. US means US. <laughs> okay, can somebody tell me what is the common element here to this chart? So we have now, this is like India's top 10 funded startups. Can somebody make out what is the common element? Technology. Sorry, technology. 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 Do you guys like to take a chance? Platform providers. Okay. External Asset investors. Like. Okay. Yeah. Asset tech. Okay. B two C. Okay. <laughs> okay. So see, if you see, there are only three investors here who are putting in money. Tiger, Tiger, SoftBank, SoftBank, and Sequoia. So what I what I want to want to want to show you, you open your eyes and see that uh, ultimately everything has to get consolidated, right? So at one point in time, there was a discussion that only Amazon and Alibaba will remain and everybody else will be folded into them. So how startup ecosystem is working currently is that all of these three guys have got their monopolies. They know that they, they are only three are there and out of these three also two will be left and one will die. Die or maybe folded into the, the, the third second part. So how it, how it works is that these guys take sector calls. So they just say that, okay, I want to put $500 million in the sector. Valuation does not matter to them, right? Ultimately, what matters to them is that we have to have stake in each and every startup in this sector, maybe big or small, between all three of us is a cartel. And uh, that's how we should put in money. So Tiger, when Tiger puts in money, they, they do talk about what is the valuation of the company, right? So they just put in money. So if your valuation of the company can be $100 million in the last round, they can they can take it up to the thousand, $1 million in the second round. They, the company can become a unicorn. Right, and we, we we see all of these stories coming up in that how this company has become unicorn and all. So ultimately, what 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 the world is moving towards is that ultimately there will be a consolidation of capital that will happen in the future. We will all see that, and these startups uh, which are not being able to do well, loss making startups, would ultimately be folded into the startups which will be able to do well, and there will be a consolidation that will that will happen. So that's that's the common element which I wanted to show to you. Actually, and it plays a very big money. role when, when you actually go and uh, 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 do the valuations or the funds do the valuation of the company, right? So you will get to know about it in more much more detail when Amrish will take it up in the next slides. But yeah. So I was just saying SoftBank has done already, like they went to, when they went to, you know, like Singapore, like yeah. uh, bought yeah. Uber, Uber, bought, bought out by, yeah. so, you know, uh, Grab and okay. now. Yeah. So they are trying to make, uh, yes, you know, so they have been trying that. Correct. So SoftBank again has increased its allocation to Vision Fund also. I think Amrish will take that up also. So you will see that SoftBank is again coming in. Tiger is again active now. Sequoia has, has been active always. So, so it's like they would be the biggest investors and then others will follow. That's how it happens. Well, ultimately they have to exit. Ultimately they have to exit. That's, that's important, right? And that's why uh, there's whole of this Zomato not performing, Paytm not performing. <coughs> there's a lot of UN cry because ultimately they know that they have to exit. And they have to exit 
only uh, between three of them, right? So <laughs> there's nobody else who can buy, right? So they know that ultimately it has to go to the public. Yeah. Public has to take a take a buy. They cannot hold on to it for long. So they cannot keep these startups going on for like next 10, 15 years, right? So, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. I understand that they are investing, but they don't care about the valuation. Sure. And we, as we know, that most of them actually in the loss making. Sure. And they can't exit as well because who's go they're going to buy it at such a high valuation and all. So why are they doing it? Like, who's investing it? Who's the funder investor who is building it? In this? I know Ty Global is offering all those things with investors, but what's the logic behind it? No, no, so, so what's the logic behind crypto? Tell me. What is the logic about cryptocurrency? Is there any logic behind cryptocurrency? See, it's an asset class. Ultimately, you have to understand that it's an asset class and these venture capital funds are getting money from the uh, wealthy families and uh, it's, they have they've made it as an asset class. And ultimately, it's all it will all depend upon how the exit is happened. So I think Amrish will be able to explain this in a better way because he will be explaining it to you in, by way of an example. So you will come to know uh, maybe another 20 minutes and I think you will be clear on what is happening here. Okay, so I'll, I'll maybe invite Amrish to uh, take it ahead. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks, Kandha, for setting the context. And first of all, again, thanks for uh, entire ICA chapter. So I think it's more like audit documentation. I should say thanks <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure so. You you have a lot of questions, and I came to know from again committee members like there's a lot of overwhelming response to this topic of startup valuation and you all have come on this day especially some some have festive uh, programs at their home for to understand how to value startups and looking forward to hear us out but I want to to say sorry I'm not going to talk about anything on valuations <laughs> and and how can I talk about valuations because startups are not, not, never valued so if something which is which, which is not valued, how I can talk about anything? <clears throat> so if we if we see, startups are not valued; they're priced, and there is a difference between value and price. And just to answer your question, when you asked that, why they all are investing into it, uh, because they are doing the pricing of the startups and not the valuation of the startups. So it's it's a very important element to be understand whenever we talk about the startup, we talk about the startup valuation, we talk about the billion dollar number they are getting. The billion dollars number they are getting is not a valuation. It's a price they are getting. And there is a difference between value and price which in subsequent slides I am going to explain. But Professor Ashwadamodran has really explained this concept in a very simple way and make it a very simple thing to understand by general public. Is that, see if we, so if we look at from a pricing perspective rather than a value perspective, many things in our mind will sort out. Whenever we look at it from valuation perspective, we talk about cash flow, we talk about profitability, we talk about uh, losses. But when we talk about, look at it from the perspective of pricing, all this question will go away. That why they are losing money, still getting so, so much funds and value, because they are pricing it. Second, there is nothing complex about startup valuation. It's a very simple technique. What any investor do as a trader mindset, they pick any metrics, apply that metrics, and do the valuation. And for applying the metrics, they find out what's the PF. That's all. It's that simple thing in a startup world. We as a professional or as an investor sometimes make it complex. We want to really see what kind of cash flows they have, what kind of things they have. But in startup as an investment class, so first of all, as Gandhav has laid out, startup Tech startup is an investment class. So you have to be just a salesman. Yeah. <laughs> and then and I'll come to, to that point. Why it's very important for a promoter to be a salesman. And it's very important for a promoter to sell his vision, not to product. It's it's a difference that any founder has to when he's communicating to investor, he has to sell his vision not about make him believe, that's all. Not make him believe. Yeah, yeah. Believe. And so you can make him believe when you sell your vision, not your product. Product a per, many person or many company can make a product, but reason is something which is related to a one person. And if he is convinced a investor about his reason, then the money start pouring into it. So this is how the entire <laughs> ecosystem has really worked. 
in the private equity, they also say that you don't uh, put in money in the asset, but on the management. On management, yeah. So only the management. <laughs> Wait, it's like in Hindi, it says that you have money on the house. So in any case, since, since the topic was something like we need to discuss about valuation, so I put put in certain slides on the certain theoretical valuation techniques which are there. Uh, and and if we see that uh, they're both modern and uh, traditional techniques, the modern techniques are something which are used to price the startups. And and those techniques are basically VC method, scorecard method, forecast, uh, first Chicago method, real option. We are going to discuss a couple of them just to give you a flavor that how any VC basically look into the valuation stuff. And then traditional valuation methods which we all know like DCF, comparable company method, comparable transaction method. So like during the early stages which is from concept to growth, it's mainly the modern valuation techniques or modern pricing techniques which are mainly used. And as the company more matured, some, someone start looking at the cash flows and those methods are being ultimately applied to value them. So, before we really deep dive into the techniques, I think it's really important to understand what are the drivers of this pricing, that how, how this pricing is being decided and what, what are the drivers. And in the initial 15-20 uh, minutes, we have discussed a lot about the availability of capital. So definitely all these numbers and as Gandhav has said that it has happened because so much capital is now right now available. And if we, if we specifically see uh, in 2021, SoftBank has almost like 24% allocation in their vision fund, which is basically the fund primarily designed to invest into tech startups. And from March 2021, the allocation increased to 38%. And, they have, and you have seen in 2021 the way the investment in tech startup system has increased. So it's, it's primarily, as the big investors, they are allocating more funds towards, uh, towards the startup ecosystem the demand is increasing. So, so when we again go back to the concept of value versus price, so, and we have read in our economics, and we all come from like that economic background, what is the price? Price is all dependent upon demand and supply. So if there's a lot of demand, then definitely the price is going to increase. So if there's a lot of capital available to be invested, it's, it's quite often that the demand of startups or the valuation or the pricing of startup is going to increase. So this is the one of the key factor which is uh, driving the price. Second is definitely the value versus price and I'm going to share a couple of examples on this and just to answer uh, your question also like why when a loss making companies are making uh, they're attracting investors why some investors are buying and the other investors are getting exit. So in that example <coughs> you'll, you'll find your answer. The third part important part is the scalability. It's, it's about how big is the market how big is the market share the startup can get into it uh, and what's the team potential to to get that market share and to uh, to become a market leader in that market uh, size so this is the ultimate uh, crux which any investor so any any founder who sits in front of investor they have they start the discussion with this scalability to the potential which is there and why the startups are losing money because their ultimate objective is to reach or achieve that scalability. See, we have seen so many infrastructure companies, so many traditional companies, they invest upfront to create an infrastructure. Like if, uh, if you have seen in India in 5G, a lot of billions of dollars have been invested just to buy the 5G license or to 5G spectrum. Uh, but in case of startups, ultimately the money which they are investing is to achieve that scale, to acquire the uh, consumer, to acquire the customer. Though from the accounting perspective, all that amount which is being spent is shown in income statement. Therefore, we all see so, so, such a loss. Had it been capitalized, had it been capitalized as customer acquisition cost, the startups might have also given accounting profit. So it's only that since they are incurring cap, uh, operating expenditure to acquiring those customers, we see that they are making losses. But they have to do that part. If they stop incurring uh, expenditure on acquiring customers, they will not achieve scalability. So scalability is very critical for any startup and, and the scalability is also critical from pricing perspective. And last is the investor's right. So with all high pricing, there comes a very aggressive demands. 
we always talk we we see into our newspapers looking at like that company has got billion dollar valuation that company has got multi billion and everything but one should really ask the life of a founder life of an entrepreneur and once i was sitting with a with a very renowned founder in in indian market and he just raised a good uh, 200 million dollars from a vc invest and i asked him like you must be feeling quite happy and all that so if i i can speak that hindi words which he he, he told kata kya maze aate rocket lag jate piche okay so so the investors come with lot of demands on them and this many investor rights and one of them is the liquidation preference so if we look at the the number in isolation without the rights which they are getting it's always give a distorted figure so uh, we are going to discuss about this a uh, liquidation preference concept and the within liquidation preference how many times of investment amount of liquidation preference they have really have a very significant impact on the price of a startup and this is one more re reason why when all this companies especially in indian market when they went for ipo they all benchmark the ipo price with the last funding round what happened like last funding if it happened at like 5 billion dollars so everyone expected that okay the ipo will come at 7 billion dollars but at the time that analysis should have been done that 5 billion dollars have included a liquidation preference value embedded to it and once the company become ipo that right goes away so that value which is embedded in that 5 billion dollars because of liquidation preference is really out so no one made that adjustment so that is also very important part so these are the four factors so in next maybe like 25 30 minutes i'll cover each of the factor with relevant examples which will give you more perspective about about the startup <coughs> so to start with value versus price and again i'd like to focus more on this part because after this seminar i really want all of you to come out from that traditional investor perspective looking at startup start looking it from a trader perspective start evaluating it more as a demand and supply game and it's nothing else and therefore if someone asks that still that company is making loss and why they are getting value because they are priced the startup is priced startup is not valued and to understand this example in a best way is to look it into the whatsapp and facebook acquisition though it's it's a slightly dated example but very perfect example to understand the concept of trader and investor mindset like in 2014 there it was a news everywhere that facebook acquired whatsapp for 19 billion dollars and at that time the whatsapp was still to find up appropriate monetization strategy for their user base so it was hardly making any revenue still that company getting a 19 19 billion dollars valuation was something amazing to that startup ecosystem and they were all saying that facebook did not make this acquisition in a proper way and it's, it's all bullshit and um, bullshit and everything but now if we just take out the concept of that traditional investor and look it from a greater perspective by the end of next slide you will see how strategically facebook did that acquisition and it really makes sense so when when uh, facebook acquired uh, whatsapp at a time few data points which were there was that whatsapp was one of the best platform for social media uh, it has the maximum user base like if you look at the four year history uh, whatsapp was literally a market leader in that social media industry were able to have a lot of engagement with the users because like in social media user engagement is the key metric and it is very important that you have to keep your user engaged on the platform the more you can keep your engaged user engaged the more could be the potential option to monetize money from that user so therefore at that time for facebook they, they were looking at the things how they can keep their users engaged and they found that whatsapp is now is is a market leader who has the maximum number of users they have the maximum number of user engagement like there were almost 19 billion messages which were exchanging every day on the whatsapp platform there were 200 million voice messages and the videos so such a kind of engagement which was there and from a trader perspective the way social media companies are valued there is a metrics called ev per user enterprise value per user this is the metrics which is quite commonly used in social media and at that point of time facebook was a listed entity and the 
AV per user metrics which Facebook was getting was $130 per user. So market cap or enterprise value of Facebook divided by the number of user which Facebook had, it was $130 per user. And there were other social media platforms also which were in that range only. <coughs> Someone at $75 per user, some were at $150 per user, but everyone from that EV per user matrix were in that mindset. So from a trader mindset, what are you going to monitor the matrix? How they are going to monitor the metrics? So ultimately, now if you see the Google, initially Google was just a search engine. But now the Google ad is one of the major revenues. So they have looked at the habit of a user and now they are doing targeting marketing. Same is with what the Facebook, with YouTube. Now you type anything of Google and you get the similar videos on YouTube. Yeah. So now all these platforms are so connected and the target marketing is such has become a powerful tool both from making money for the startups and from the customer perspective so there are many monetization tools which they have to do it uh, which at a definitely at a scale they are able to generate lot of revenue to it so so therefore having so during the early stages of the business cycle it's very important for them to have lot of users on the platform so therefore the first focus is to get the user then they shift the focus to the next level that now get a lot of uh, start generating money by different different monetization ways. So, targeted marketing is one of the way to monetize it. I'm looking at the same. But if Paul was going to buy you, how he is going to validate the metrics you are producing to you? How that that metrics is being validated? Yes, what is I'm saying? X number of users are there for me. How the unprovided is going to validate the metrics? Sorry, I couldn't get the last. I'm going to sell my company. I said I'm a startup. I'm going to sell. I'm going to get a price for my product. Yeah. I'm saying the one million users I got. How the, the the opposite side is going to monitor the metrics. So there's and a cost of acquisition, CAC, which we call it. So basically, to acquire any customer, you have to incur a spend. So there's a spend on, on every customer that you make, right? If you're getting that customer uh, today without may, having to make that spend. That, that that acquisition is valuable, right? So you need to, you would have to have to spend hundred million dollars to acquire hundred customers. You getting the correct customers, so you need to pay something for that. So it can be it can be more, it can be valued by either by by an organic way where you say that okay, if I would have to acquire these customers, what is the money that I have to pay, or what is the multiple that these companies are getting per user, which which just which just just explained that Facebook was a listed entity at that point in time. So market cap divided by number of users was the matrix used by by Facebook to acquire WhatsApp, right? So it can be either of the things that you can look at. And ultimately, obviously, you have to acquire these users today and the monetization will happen after three years, four years, when those users will be so uh, adapted to your platform that they will not be able to leave your platform, right? So today you cannot leave Facebook, right? You cannot leave WhatsApp. So you have become addicted to the, these platforms. And that, that today is the time when they are monetizing uh, your time that you are spending on those social media platforms. So again, one more unique thing with startup is that they really want to change the consumer behavior. The way you do a certain thing like Amazon. Right now, we have been inclined towards doing an online shopping. That, that convenience factor which is there. And now, if they have started charging delivery charges and other things, we don't mind doing because we have become habitual to it. So, so therefore, for startup, the main focus is to First, get the user on platform, so they have to spend a lot of cost to acquire the user. Then they make them habitual using that platform by giving a lot of offerings and free uh, free things to them. Once they become habitual, then they start monetizing. So it's it's a journey. It's not that from, from day one itself, you will see startups making profits. Because like it's someone has to create a uh, factory, like again in case of a, a, a telecom, one has to really buy the, that 5G. Spectrum invest lot of money there. So for startup, this is the investment. Like first, they they have to acquire a user, spend money for it. They have to spend time to change their behavior. And once the behavior is changed, they will monetize it. So it's it's a journey for them. So coming back on the example, so what at that point of time it was identified that out of the 400 million users which were WhatsApp have, 160 million were the unique uh, users which which WhatsApp uh, which Facebook analyzes that is going to be something could add value directly to the Facebook uh, and using that 160 million into 130 per share the value was coming 21 billion dollars and so they negotiated 19 billion so from Facebook perspective it's a good deal 
the value was 21, they, they were able to get a 10% discount near above. But another unique thing they, they did, they paid the maximum consideration by view of shares of us Facebook. So tomorrow, if this multiple get corrected, market corrects this multiple, then this entire 19 billion dollar will also get corrected. So this is how uniquely this acquisition was structured. Now if you analyze from a trader mindset, that ultimately investors got exit. Facebook at that point of time, given their scale size, everything got a good asset to keep their users engaged. And if the correction happened on the valuation side, Facebook is not going to lose anything. For, uh, for investors of WhatsApp, for WhatsApp founders itself, $19 billion is really a great number. If something also get corrected, that's still, they, they made a lot of money. And there, there was news that even a, a office boy in WhatsApp was become, became a millionaire at that point of time. So, <laughs> because of his ops and everything. So this is, this is the trader mindset. And now we have to understand whenever we talk about startup, we need to talk about this look from this trader perspective and not from a value perspective and this is how all the startups are being priced. Moving forward on this pricing strategy, now it's not that today I just come and say that okay I have this product and the peer group is getting that much value so even I as a startup should get that much value. It's not that, that easy from a founder perspective. They really have to convince investors, they have to convince the third party to justify that that the potential is huge for them and to justify the potential they have to justify the market size in which they are operating what kind of market share they have because this two metrics of market size and market share has a direct impact on the pricing of a startup now the question is that how this market price and market size is being uh, communicated to the uh, to the investors and there's a term here which is quite commonly used it's called tan samsung so whenever we talk about any market sizing, these are the three terms which is being used. Tank is the total addressable market. So this is the like the entire universe uh, for the startup to whom a startup can potentially cater to it. So take example of a, uh, any startup who come with the Ayurvedic cosmetic products. So for that startup, cosmetic industry, something is a tank for them. This is the total addressable market. So anyone using any cosmetic product is a potential user. From TAM comes the SAM, which is the serviceable addressable market. So given the kind of specific product which they have, like taking example of Ayurvedic cosmetic. Now, out of the total cosmetic, Ayurvedic cosmetic has become a SAM, serviceable addressable market for that startup. So therefore, always a discussion with the investor starts with a multi, multi, I would say trillion, uh, uh, trillion dollars potential, which is TAM. It will shrink to SAM, that now out of that one, trillion, the potential is, is multi-billion. There it comes the SOM, which is the serviceable, obtainable market which investor targets in the nearest maybe one or two to two years. So this is how a story, a narrative is being written or communicated by any founder to the investor. So, so for anyone doing the pricing of startup, it's very important to understand that narrative. So when we also do a lot of valuation for startup, mainly from a compliance perspective, or maybe from transaction perspective, if we are doing any pricing, then our thesis always start with the market size. Our thesis start with TAM, SAM, so on, and where the, uh, the startup will look market like. Market size, market size, market segmentation, and your, um, your, your market share. Yeah. Market share. Market. And why this is important? Because when we talk about one of the method, VC method, there you will see the key inputs are this this th uh, things and therefore why, it's very important. Sorry, so why money is coming in India, not going to Vietnam, or not going to a uh, country where there is no population? Size of the market. Size of the market, right? So why why India? Why after why after US, India and China are getting the maximum amount of investment from the investors? That's that's these three terms that we share on the screen. Nothing else. Otherwise, money can even go to Australia. Money can even go to elsewhere, right? It's not going. Going in, it's coming in India and China. So this is the reason because investors always believe in consumption story. So everybody wants to believe in consumption story that okay, any product or service will come out in the market, it will be taken up immediately because of the size of the market that it, it will cater to. But, but uh, is, is this also getting impacted because of the spending capacity and the increase yeah. in per capita that That's these right. larger uh, uh, countries or geographies have now? 
been able to address because earlier the per capita was not at that level where it could have uh, uh, filtered through in the second or third layer, right? Because yeah. therefore, a Europe was a better location for uh, for a startup which is going for, let's say, a product or a beauty product or something like that, right? Yeah, but it depends. It also depends upon the sector that you are servicing, yeah. right? So, like for example, Zomato. Zomato okay. is servicing uh, uh, low GDP per capita income economy, right? So okay. it is becoming now difficult because they have uh -huh. already reached a scale where they are not able to add more users. That is why you will see in, in the case study that we will present that now there is a downturn in the price which is coming up. Yeah. So it is all a factor of what exactly are you catering to, right? So that is why the investor is also very smart. So you will see maximum valuation coming in B2C, not in B2B. So there are a lot of startups which are B2B also, right? But you will see maximum uh, valuation or maximum money coming in a B2C startup because they also want to see the market size expanding. Yeah, in fact, that's where you see that some of the incoming startups, which are global startups going into some of these regions, find it the most difficult market to be also, right? Because so from actually, if you see most of these investors are from US market. And uh -huh. from US perspective, India and China, they are the best words. So anything talking about itself, US and China, everyone sees, okay, it's a huge market to get into. So from, from fund perspective, when they go to pension funds, they talk about India-China. So I would say India-China as a geography has become a lot of buzzword. And therefore, for, for uh, fund houses, it's easy to raise money from pension fund when they talk about US-China historically. For fund houses, it's easy to invest into tech companies who are tech catering to India-China as a geography. So that, I think, layer was, was established. Some, some corrections definitely happening now. But this is how originally happened. Yeah. yeah so, so just just talking about India, China was a big. Yeah. So, is it that in B two B valuation, uh, it's more traditional versus the B two C, which is. No, so B two B is also going to be a pricing only in case of tech startups, uh, because there are many you would have come across many enterprise B two B ventures uh, which have come up with softwares <coughs> and technology catering to and other enterprises. There's a huge potential, and they're also getting a billion dollars valuation. It's only the time to reach to a unicorn. So you will find that generally a B2C startups, their journey to unicorn, a successful startup, is slightly lower compared to an enterprise uh, SaaS-based uh, startup. They will also reach to unicorn using such kind of metrics only, uh, but they will take some time because definitely it takes time to convince an enterprise to start using that product versus uh, consumer. So, so this is the reason. On the, on the B2B, probably uh, real-time example, out of the press today morning, Naspers built this. Yeah. Uh, any insight as to what went wrong with the valuation because of it? They have to follow the deed or? Mm -hmm. The process deed got cancelled. That, that one. So not speed up to speed. I'm not up to speed today morning news yeah. because we were in the fly. <laughs> so in case anything has happened today morning, we'll not be up sure. to speed with it. Uh, but we're sharing a couple of case of a B2B yeah. where everything was done in the late stage. The deal has been called off. There are a lot of rumors around whether there was some technicality. It was a September 30th deadline. Blah blah blah. But I'm sure there is some exceptional consideration around valuation or whatever that led to the calling off of the deal. Something would have been happened definitely, and uh, as we move forward, we have also shared a couple of examples where the valuation reached to a hundred billion dollars or fifty billion dollar and came down to almost negligible now. So why it happened? So that may provide you some insight. So what would be the potential reasons? Uh, See, what has happened also that you know a lot of these deals happened early part of the year, you know, uh, and when the valuation prices were high, you know, like you even see even. Tesla founder was trying to acquire yeah. Twitter, so oh, there's yeah. a lot of story around the Twitter, issue. The Twitter you know? so they were trying to back out because of whatever corporate governance issue or the number of users, but that's not the real case, the real case was the valuation, yeah. because the valuation catered down so much, yeah. they thought it is better to pull off rather than paying so much price what was agreed, so that's what happening in the market right now, that a lot of deals which have happened earlier are trying to reprice, if they can reprice, they have not able to reprice and come to a price. Trying to follow up those deals. Yeah, so the other part of that, sorry, the other part of that question, we have seen some recent examples. 
I think the ability of the institutional investors, and I like the slide that you put uh, as well, are about those three institutional investors, yeah. right? Who are, there is a concentration right. there, right. or a cartel, to borrow your uh, term. But the ability of those institutional investors to go beyond the founders to institute prudent practices. We are all CAs, so we look at prudent practices. And I go by your statistic, you said four out of the ten startups, if it succeeds, they are okay. Yeah. The VCs are okay. Yeah, I thought the number was two out of ten. No, no, but but to no, like no, a home brand. See, see yeah. how it happens. Sir. Let me just answer. So how it happens is, so if there are ten companies. Out of ten companies, two will go completely out. Correct. One or two will, they will still recover whatever investment they have. One or two they will make one or two times, and one or two companies they will make exponential return. So overall, over five year term, if you see the industry of the VCs, they make approximately between twenty to thirty percent higher yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 they make at a portfolio level. So it's not a company level pricing. It is a portfolio level, and every company, every VC has a certain. Expertise in a particular categories of investment, whether they are CDs, they are CDs, B, C, D, C, and they try to liquidate in the next round. It's, if they are a Series A investor, they try to liquidate in Series B. If they are a Series B investor, they try to liquidate in Series B and C. If they are a Series C or D investor, they try to liquidate in an IQ. So, so there is an exit for each side of investors, and so not so that connotation of that every eight of two companies succeed and eight does not make money is wrong. The six companies in that portfolio still actually recover the investment and make them some return. Yeah. Only one or two companies completely go out of business. Yeah. One last point, I think it will be interesting to see in the coming years, given where the liquidity and all is going. Well, how, how, I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking at how do institutional investors go beyond the founders to institute prudent practices so that, you know, the, the they return. Are, they are doing, no? Yeah. 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 And also, you are sharing a lot of stories, <laughs> and you guys can tell us probably later during sure. dinner. Yeah, yeah. How? Because we are also hearing that uh, in terms like soft bank, right? Uh, a lot of professional seniors who are associated with Song yeah. are leaving the company because they are not able to yeah. put up with this flamboyant uh, okay. pricing or valuations sure. or whatever. So, yeah. Fabrice, I have just interrupted you a bit. Um, what is the role liquidity plays in the valuation or pricing which you came up with the term? The Liquidity. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that point. Okay. That, that is also there. So, so I think we'll, we'll quickly run these things uh, because many answers will get answered. Many questions will get answered by the time we'll reach yes, to the sir. end of this presentation. Yes. And so accordings are taken for that. So, Sam and Sam, accordings have been. Uh, you acquired your own. No, no, they are. They are. They are the popular. It's, it's a quite, quite industry jargon. Sam, Sam, so It's quite uh, popular there. So, uh, so therefore, it's quite common. And I, I will take a couple of case studies here to explain that how this market size number has a direct impact on the valuation. And to pick that study, uh, we have taken it from, uh, again, uh, Professor, Professor Damodaran's blog on uh, valuation of Uber. So what happened, like in 2014, he first valued Uber. And being a, uh, one of the valuation guru, he's always keep excited to valuation of different, different companies. And uh, when he first heard about uh, Uber getting billion dollar valuation, which was I think 50 billion Uber got in 2014. So he got excited that what's this company because he never heard about or practically use Uber at that point of time. Uh, so based upon his limited research, uh, he talked about uh, Uber here, he discussed about Uber, he, he literally sat into a Uber car, talked to the driver, the kind of benefits it could generate both for passenger, both for driver and then he come out with a thesis that okay, According to him, the market positioning of an Uber is an urban car. It's something could provide a good service to a, a, a young urban category of people who can use mobile phone to book a cab, book the cab anytime, sit and just travel from one place to another. And this is going to be primarily in a metro kind of metro city kind of uh, situation. And therefore, overall market size he estimated was hundred billion dollars out of within that projected market share ten percent, and he came up with a price of. 5.9 billion versus of 53. So when he published this uh, valuation, all his thesis on on internet, lot of criticism was came from uh, VC's side, especially when they were pricing at 53 billion dollars. So the VC then narrate a story saying that it's not an urban car uh, company. It's it's ultimately a logistic and transportation company uh, catering or operating in that wider industry because it can disrupt the entire way people are moving from one place to another and definitely there came a point of time when 
using Uber Ola has become so uh, so easy that people just stop using their own cars and they were traveling through this and there was also network impact like today in Singapore you are using Uber or it's not in Uber today rather when it was there uh, if you go to US simply with the same app everything you can book the cab you, you go to India so there was a network effect for the users so therefore once they change the positioning and thesis the, the VC investors stay, theory was that being a market leader, they are going to grab a major market share. So they were looking at $50 billion number. So doing, doing this maths of market size and market, they were coming with a valuation of $53 billion. That is the VC, uh, from a VC perspective. So Damodran again, after a few months itself, revalidate, try to revalidate re his assumption. He changed some of the assumptions and he himself came with a number of $23.4 billion. Now you can see the range. And there's nothing wrong and right about it. It's only the assumption on the market size and market share. So therefore, these are the two critical factors which really plays a significant role on how to price a startup. And for anyone who's trying to justify this price number, have to really justify on the market size and market share. So this is all about, like I would say, the 90% discussion on the pricing within the startup ecosystem role is, is, is around. Like they, they talk about the market size, they talk about the market share. And very, very important, one more case study to be discussed is on Bird. This is a startup which we, within a period of 1.25 years became a unicorn. And they were news like within a 1.25 years, uh, how can a company become a unicorn? And what really happened there? Uh, what exactly? And even like today in the flight only I was telling so when even I was deep diving more in this thing, uh, I was looking at different articles. So it came that the founder in 2018 just found that why people using such huge cars. So this is their problem statement that why they're using two tons of metal to move a 70 kg body uh, when the same could be done with a scooter. So I was thinking like in India, we have been using scooter for so many years <laughs> and no one really valued that thing. <laughs> now this startup uh, within a 1.25 year has become a, uh, become a unicorn. Why? Because this is the kind of story they told to the investor. See, this we pick from the investor presentation, how beautifully they, they, they presented the overall time Samsung. So these are the birds, if you could, you can't see it once you enlarge it, these are the birds they have created. Like this is a folk of entire birds. So this is, so they, they define that they like the eight trillion trips which happens in a year, like going from one place to another. Out of that, five trillion trips are below five million. So definitely any, any uh, communication, any transportation mean could be used, uh, which is less than five million. So it need not to be a... Five miles. five miles, sorry, five miles. Uh, and uh, out of that, they work out that 900 billion are, are their target customers. So, using all this math, they ultimately work out that 800 billion is a potential market size they can get it into. Out of that, they work out a SAM of 80 billion. And this is their saying, like, this is the potential opportunity there, and they're just catering to this, this one small bird when there's so many birds are there. And see the impact, like, in early 2018, there were only 50,000 users on their platform and within a period of 9 months, by September 2018, they, were, they had 2 million users on their platform. This is the kind of scalability they could able to generate and therefore they become a unicorn during this journey. And in 2021, their revenue was 250 million. So for a company within a period of 3 million re reaching to that scale, well, this is something which excites investor and therefore they command such so much price. The price of 50,000 user to 2 million, no traditional company can do it in 9 months. So that's why they, they get, they get so, a lot of excitement from the investor. So, so therefore, like uh, right now, uh, by 22, they are saying they are in 450 cities with 150 million rights. So this is the kind of scale they are, they are achieving. So now, after looking at this practical examples, it's good to deep dive a couple of minutes on, on a theory which is or theoretical method which is being applied uh, for for pricing the startup and this method is called VC method uh, which is quite commonly used by most of the VC uh, VC players uh, but that how they do pricing so what they do 
they do not basically look at the entry valuation. So, and we all know that all the VC funds they invest for a limited period because they have their own life cycle. The, the fund have generally a life cycle of 10 to 12 years. So therefore, when they make an investment into a company, they make an investment for five to seven years. So what VC investors look look into it whenever they look at any startup debt, what is the potential of that startup to generate a revenue or any other metrics, what they feel relevant. For example, in case of e-commerce, it was GMV, gross merchandise value. In case of social media, it was number of users. In case of Enterprise says it was annual recurring revenue ARR. So th there are different metrics which, which is being used. Uh, that after five years, how this company will perform on those metrics. So they just make assumption how that fifth year number is being drive depends upon the market size and market share that company can get. So based upon their thesis, they will work out that okay, after five years, the startup could be at hundred million dollars in terms of say revenue. Looking at other peer groups, which include public companies, which include other transactions which happened, they work out a multiple to debt matrix. So assuming like in enterprise SaaS, you would have heard that the multiple to ARR is 10x, it's quite common. So 10 times of the annual recurring revenue is quite common in a uh, enterprise SaaS uh, industry. So they will work out, okay, after five years, 10 million ARR this enterprise SaaS can generate, uh, multiply by 10, so this uh, the startup has a potential to become one billion dollars startup after five years. So that one billion number they will discount it back using their return expectation, which in case of VC is generally 25 to 30 percent, but it will vary. It could go up to 50 percent also. But like use so discounting that number back to the present value. So maybe one billion discounting by say 25 30 percent to present value may work out say 200 million. This hypothetical number and they are investing say 20 million into the company. So they will decide okay for 20 million. We, we are going to get 10% stake in the company and that's how the deal is negotiated. But today we will say this kind of company which yet to generate revenue, they have been valued at $200 million. They, they, are, they do not get $200 million today. The way any VC investor they have done, they, they look at the potential value of $1 billion after 5 years, which depends upon the market size and the market share they could command and the kind of multiple which it could be there and then backward they arrive at the present value. So this is how this VC method is being applied. The multiple is the future one or the present one? Because so they do a lot of, so they, they look at the present one only, like of a company of that size of who is doing hundred million dollars. First one, first one is profit evaluation. Second one is relative evaluation. You are combining both. So, the so, it's, so it's not a prospective, you are, they, they are not calculating a forward multiple. So you are confusing with a forward multiple. It's not a forward multiple. It's a multiple they are applying after five years to that company. Even if a hundred million dollar company today is getting a ten, 10 times of multiple in public market. So similarly, the same company assuming the same ecosystem environment is there, they can also get a 10x. It's not that they are not cal calculating a forward multiple on the today's market cap using the fifth year just to uh, answer you, what can be the exit multiple that they would get at the time of exit? That's what they are estimating to, based on the current situation or the uh, success stories of some of the exits that would have happened in the past. They are they are estimating the exit multiple that they would get after five years. Because the price, because the company has low revenue now, you know, you can't do a comparison. So the company is growing. The company will only grow at a certain stage at the year of five. That time it can be listed, and that is the time when the investor will exit. So they will use a multiple at that point of time. So it's not the multiple which are going to be used, which is the future. No, no, no. Multiple will be the current, whatever is the comparison multiples going in the market. But the multiple is applied on the revenue, which is the future figure. Yeah, but then you are discounting it back. Comparing both prospective as well as the yeah. relative relationship. Yeah, but, but then you are discounting it back. So you are bringing it to a present value of what is the present value. Because then you see the, 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 the discounting, so you discount, then you bring it to the present value. So you are calculating the future valuation. But then you bring it back to the response. So this is how it works. Like standing, you say maybe in FY21 they will work out that what is the potential value they could have there using some metrics, and then they will bring it back to the current value. And, and then they, they create a kind of <coughs> metrics just for negotiation purpose. That okay, this this kind of revenue multiples are there. Uh, this is the stake. What kind of hire they make? So different kind of then metrics they they prepare to really arrive at a number. And as I told you, like. For different startups, they are different metrics. They do not really value it based upon one single matrix of PVA, beta, multiple, or any profit. Right now, in the current scenario, definitely they have started looking at profitability as one of the benchmark. 
uh, which was not earlier. Uh, but definitely, the other benchmarks are more relevant there. And uh, the, the way ecosystem is evolving, I'm sure EV beta multiple is going to be quite common for valuation for pricing of startups. But so, so I, I, we have basically listed out some of the multiple which is co commonly used de depending upon the industry. So Rich, if you can briefly also mention about some of the regulatory bodies that are, or if you are going to cover in some of the other slides, <coughs> how the regulatory uh, environment is now uh, developing and then given all these pack and uh, different kinds of methods uh, which are accelerating uh, the withdrawal of the return. Sure. So, so many, so many, so aspect I would say is one of the ex potential exit options yeah. which evolves. It's just only a way to get the company listed. So maybe this is a specific uh, portion which we have kept on an exit itself because for any startup exit is very critical. Uh, so all this entry valuation is directly linked with the exit. So therefore we have kept a section on exit. Okay. So maybe once we complete. Sure. Yeah, so I was trying to understand more on the regulatory part where law because public at large investors. So if you would have seen the news class. in the last 10, 10, 15 days, I think SEBI has Se come up with a circular, yes. yeah. right? So what SEBI is doing is, and now SEBI is monitoring the entry valuation also. Correct. So what they are doing is, that they are telling, or they have, they have sent, actually they have sent a questionnaire to the uh, uh, VC fund. So like the VC fund that we, the portfolio comes to the VC fund that we value, we have come back to us only to how to answer those questionnaires. Mm. So what they are doing is, and now they are questioning that how are you valuing those startups at every uh, financial reporting date or maybe when you are making the entry. So they want to know that what methods you applied, what value you used, what kind of approach did you apply. So all of that is being asked by SEBI right at the, right the entry or maybe at the middle so stage the of the ABC value. Or whatever, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so that's, that's what started happening now because ultimately SEBI also understands that there's a lot of hue and cry about all these IPOs going down by 50%. If you see today, Zomato, Paytm and all are running down by 50%, right? So it's all public money which is which is, which is gone. So I think regulatory bodies specifically in India are getting very active now. US may already SEC is very active. So we will see a little bit of change coming in, uh, in coming times where you will see that there can be some kind of regulatory actions that will come in uh, in case of startups as well in terms of valuation as well. So what you can do, what you cannot do, right? But they don't want to stop this flow of money coming in India. So, so they are like, obviously, so they, they are in like two shoes, right? So they don't want to uh, hamper the growth also yeah. because they want that money, right? Modi ji wants that money to come into India. At the same time, they don't want a fraud to happen. Tomorrow, Harshad Mehta kind of a scam to happen uh, in the startup space that uh, yeah. completely stops it, right? So, so they are being very cautious. At the same time, uh, going ahead with coming up with these circulars, little bit of circulars. Yeah, because for the other players, the exit might be still possible. So, in the in, if you look at the uh, red heading perspectives of the IPOs, uh -huh. uh, now what is happening is that SEBI is also asking uh, companies to give key performance indicators in the IPO yeah. red heading perspective itself. So, like if you see OYO, OYO has just amended its DRHP. They are not delaying their uh, IPO because they want to become profitable and then come out with the IPO rather than coming up with the IPO and then becoming profitable. So all of that has started happening with this regulatory push that is coming in. So we'll, we'll cover that IPO thesis. Sure. Yeah. So but one, one, one more thing like it's especially from Indian market it's important to again educate the public investor that a startup as an asset class one cannot look into from a profit matrix only. There are other metrics so therefore when uh, in IPO in, in the prospectus they want the KPIs to be mentioned because Startups can't be just valued based on the profit. So this is one thing one has to really understand. If they are putting money in the startup ecosystem, that they have to think upon the metrics beyond profitability because why they are incurring losses? Because they need to achieve the scale. Without making that investment, they can't achieve the scale. So if they stop investing money in acquiring customer, then the scale will not come, then all those values will not come. So it's, it's a vicious circle, I would say, and therefore, just looking into that, since startup are not ma making profits, therefore the valuation come down. That education has to be done to the public investors in India. There will be always a feature. The government will come up with a statutory warning. This is a startup issue, not made for poor people. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Again. Okay. So now coming back, uh, one more interesting example here. So we talk about market size, we talk about market share, and the other important thing is the team, which we uh, we, we discussed initially, is that team plays a very important <coughs> role. And you have seen uh, various, various startup which was even free product, and they, they received a lot of money at a very good price. 
The reason being is that team plays a very important role. And to the perfect example, you would have heard about CRED. Uh, this is a startup which was founded by Kunal Shah, an ex-founder of uh, Free Charge. So when he came up with this idea of uh, um, giving <coughs> some incentives for credit card payments, creating a user base, then monetizing that user base and everything, in the initial phase itself, he, he received a lot of money from Sequoia. Why? Because he has established his credential as a successful founder who enables Sequoia to make a lot of money. Ultimately, Sequoia as a fund has to make money. And when they know a person who has already made money for them, it's always good to bet on him. And they bet on him. This is what they did. So instead of looking at the overall <coughs> metrics what product is making, what kind of thing he's doing, definitely they have a confidence that this promoter in the past have, was able to create a successful business which they were able to monetize it, make money, now again bet on this. So this kind of philosophy also works a lot in the startup ecosystem and there's a method which they apply, it's called a score, scorecard method. So scorecard method is a quite commonly used again method for pre-product companies. Where what they do is that they find out, okay, in a particular sector, generally an entry valuation is in a certain range. So it could be a million dollar, it could be two million, three million. So they look at different, different companies, okay, within this sector, an entry valuation of five million, for a very initial company is fine. Then they create a matrix, looking at, okay, five, six metrics of what's, how's the team, what's the size of opportunity, product they are planning to make, what's the competition, what partnerships they have, and there are different, different factors they lay out. They put weightage to those factors, work, work out a multiple of, to, to that factor, and what this weighted average multiple, then they multiply with the entry valuation, which is there in that industry generally, and work out what kind of valuation they give to the uh, to the potential target company they value. So this is how, like without going into any cash flow, any profitability, anything, a pre-product companies are being valued and therefore this will answer to a lot of questions that how come a company without even a product are getting a million dollar valuation. This is how they get it. This is how a pricing happens. So this is one of the methods which is commonly used. Now, after like spending 20-25 minutes on modern methods, it's important to spend another 5 minutes on the traditional methods also because this is Maybe some professionals are here who would be doing valuation for compliance purposes, which we do a lot in the Indian market that we, we do valuation for compliance, so whether for financial reporting purpose or whether for any uh, RBI regulation or for income tax purpose. And for any authorities, if you start explaining all those modern techniques, it will take ages to explain to them because most of them are not itself is educated about uh, valuation itself. So explaining the modern techniques is all together, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult task. So therefore, generally we apply traditional methods and within, like in India, under Income Tax method, under income tax Act, the only method they have prescribed is discounted cash flow method. So one has to do, then apply a DCF. But when we apply DCF, there are certain things to be considered uh, in case of a startup company is that, so I'm sure most of you would be familiar with income approach DCF. Uh, where what we do, we, we project the future cash flows then discount it back to the present value. But in case of startups, it's very important that first of all, whenever we look at the free cash flows or the projection period, we have seen many times as a thumb rule perpetuity or terminal values calculated immediately after five years. But in case of startups, they will not become a mature company after five years. So therefore, applying a normal Gordon growth model, which is commonly used to calculate perpetuity, in case of startup may not be relevant. So the other means to calculate the terminal value which we are going to discuss in our case study. And that is one. Second is on the discount rate. Generally, the discount rate which we calculate uh, is, uh, is using a model called CAPM, Capital Asset Pricing Model. This is a technique to calculate a cost of equity. So that technique is good to calculate for major companies, but for startups, applying a CAPA model and working out a discount rate does not capture the risk associated with the startup itself. So therefore, the discount rate for startups when we calculate the uh, their present value are significantly higher. How to estimate those discount rate is again we are going to cover in the case study. So very recently, we, we have valued one company which is uh, into co-living space. Uh, co-living space, it means it's a, uh, what so what they do, it's a basically you can say a modernization of a traditional paying guest, modernization of a traditional hostel, uh, and modernization of a of a rental uh, 
one or two BHKs. So they have come up with an idea where they are modernizing these, providing a lot of uh, enhanced services to their students, to young professionals. And so this company, what we valued is the market leader. So for example, they, they had almost like 100 beds on their portfolio. So one of the metrics which is being used in, in this industry is called the number of beds you have. Uh, so, so therefore the driver was number of beds, what's the occupancy level of those beds and what's the price they can charge per bed. So this is the metrics first we understood, okay, this is the metrics and from the number of beds they had one leg beds on their portfolio which is like, uh, they claimed that within a specific segment of students they have they, they have 60% market share. So this is the kind of market leadership they claim to have. Uh, so we, we understood this value drivers, like okay, what's, first understand what's the revenue driver, then what's the target population because that help us to identify what's the market size they have. Then we'll, we'll look at what are the key costs, that how the unit economics will work like. Because for them, they have to take space on rental uh, and then uh, they have to uh, lease it out on a, on a daily basis or monthly basis. So we understood their key cost, what's their customer retention ratio and annual room revenue. Uh, so, so different metrics which we understood. After understanding it, so this is the, uh, this is the <coughs> uh, discount rate thesis which we generally use to value startup by using TCF method. So this is a publication which is being published by AICP of US, uh, where they have looked at the different return expectation of a startup over a period of time. And then they have worked out that depending upon the stage of development, what kind of return expectations are there. So whenever we, we value such kind of startups, we look at which kind of stage of development they are into and accordingly we pick a discount rate from this. So we do not develop discount rate using CAPM. We have picked discount rate using this, this matrix. So we, we simply apply DCA work out a valuation of 600 million for that startup. Uh, now this is like on the DCF, when we calculate the terminal value, there are two ways to calculate. One is the exit multiple. So instead of applying a Gordon growth model, uh, we one way is to calculate the what kind of multiple the startup could command after five years and then calculate the terminal value. Another is called the edge growth model. Again, this is a, there's a specific formula to do it, uh, which is defined here. Maybe once we share these slides, you can look into it. So instead of applying a normal Gordon growth model, we apply edge growth model. So edge growth model, what it says that, okay, after five years, we have a projection only up to five years, but the company is not going to achieve maturity for next, maybe another five years. So this edge model captures the growth, which is there for next five years at a high growth rate. And then it says that, okay, now the company has reached at perpetuity and a normal uh, terminal value could be computed using golden growth. So that, that is being captured here. Uh, one important analysis which we did, so once we arrived at value using DCF, using comparable transaction method and other thing, one metrics which we look into is called the annual room revenue. So we understood that in this industry, the way they pitch to investor, they say that, okay, we have an inventory of 100, uh, 10, uh, 1 lakh bets, 100,000 bets. We have a potential to generate a revenue of say $125 per bet per month, multiply by 12. This is the potential revenue they could generate and then they apply a multiple to it. This is how the pitch to investors made, how pricing has been made. So we we basically did a sanity check of our DCF using those multiple that at ARR multiple, what is our implied values coming and whether it's in line with the DCF. So it just substantiate or make our report more uh, authenticated. Like it's not only that we just pick any, so it's not an Excel working that pick, put any projections and work out the number. We did it properly, we look at the drivers, everything, work, uh, work out a number and did a sanity check using the multiples which is being used in the industry. This is how we do in our reports so that if any authority uh, look at that report, they can get convinced that it's not coming from the air, yeah, that number. Now I'll spend just last couple of minutes uh, on, the ex, uh, on some of the investor rights because as I initially told that uh, getting a good price is really <coughs> look quite fascinating but it comes with a lot of demand and one major part is the liquidation preference. So in any case, the investor have the exit rights attached to it. So in, after five years, they have to exit after seven years and um, I'll request Gandhav again to come and spend another 10 minutes to explain those exits which have happened uh, in the startup ecosystem.
the liquidation preference is something which uh, which is very critical so within liquidation preference there are basically two kind of liquidation preference one is called participative liquidation preference and second is called non participative liquidation preference what does it mean that what investor says that today i am putting say 10 million dollars into the company if the company is sold first that 10 million dollars will come back to the investor and the balance will be distributed among the shareholders including the investor so assuming you for 10 million the investor got a 20% stake in the company which means the valuation is 50 million dollars for that company tomorrow if that company is sold for 100 million so investor will get 20% of 100 million or 10 million whichever is higher so in, in any case investor will make 20 million but assuming that tomorrow that company is priced at say 20 million itself so 20 million multiplied by 20% will only be 4, 4 million but in this case investor will take 10 million back so the founders are just left with 10 million so at the initial stage it looked like the company got a valuation of 50 million but ultimately if that company got sold for uh, say 20 million because of anything so investor is is not getting 4 million for his interest in the company is getting 10 million so this is how the liquidation preference plays a role and there are different kind of liquidation preference sometimes so the example i gave was a 1x sometimes they say 2x it means that they are investing 10 million but they will first get 20 million out of the company so if there is no LP then they participate equally but if there is one LP then you will see like the red is for founder and blue is for investor up to 5 million founder does not get anything and if it further become 2, two LP, 2 times of LP, 2 times of investment up to 20 million founder was not getting anything so therefore this liquidation preference has a lot of impact on the value uh, without understanding the liquidation preference saying that a particular company got that much value maybe I, I would say it's looking at just a half story so so therefore uh, to have a complete perspective on this thing is important and that we have seen like when we do valuation and we take out the impact of liquidation preference generally the value is discounted by 30 to 40 percent of the, the investment common, amount for the common equity for common equity so assuming uh, the investment in uh, in the investor preferred share has happened say 10 dollars per share and when we apply and take out the impact of that liquidation value, the value of common share would be 5 to 6 dollars. This is the impact. And therefore now you can imagine that in IPO, if they come up with a value which was paid in the previous funding round to even higher to it, that was for, for a preferred share, not for a common share. Already that, that should have been discounted by 30 to 40 percent because once the IPO comes, they all become common shareholders. There is no liquidation preference attached to it. So that 10 dollar price which was there, with, with liquidation preference excluding was itself four to five dollars and therefore such kind of correction happens so how much generally is the average discount 30, 30, 30, 30. so it depends upon the the overall increase in value the kind of LP but we have seen 30 to 40 percent is a, is a general now, so I'll, I'll stop here but uh, we have another I think five ten minutes though we have exceeded our time because it's, it's an interesting topic but since exit is very important for any startup because the entire pricing is related to exit so I'll request Gandhav to now come up and discuss about a couple of case studies which we have made on the exit part just to give you a perspective that how those exits happen and why there is a uh, decline in the numbers. Thanks Amish, uh, the food is ready and everybody is ready. So I'm really sorry to take the time for 10 minutes but I think it is important to understand that how exits are happening so that we are able to complete the story otherwise uh, we will not be able to complete the theme that we are come up with so I would request all of you to please bear with us for the next 10 minutes we started late by the way <laughs> <laughs> so we we'll like to take this 10 minutes and then obviously we will proceed for the day so thanks Amrish for uh, taking it in uh, such a nice nice manner uh, so I will I'll maybe focus more on how now exits are happening right so we have till now been able to understand how the entry valuation is work what all criteria what all things investors see when they put in money into the company but one of the because see ultimately it is the business of the investor to generate returns for its investors right so exit is very important the, the, the most difficult part in today's ecosystem for any venture capital fund is to make an exit from the startup that they are investing in right so so that's that's what basically how how market is evolving what is exactly happening in so we have seen in developed markets like us what is happening is that there is no dearth of 
uh, exit opportunities right so we see that even the pre product stage companies uh, uh, go the ipo route and they are able to give exit to the investors so the the uh, the uh, retail investors are so mature there that they do not look at only profitability they also look at the kpis or the future potentials like one company which is like you will you would see a lot of biotech companies in us uh, getting listed quite early in, in their product life cycle even without getting the patents some companies are getting listed right because they have just crossed a, a a stage where their product will be now up ready in next whatever 6 months to 12 months but that is not happening in india india the investor mindset uh, is very different retail investor mindset is very different they want to look at the company in an organic way the way i think and even the problem is that there is no knowledge per se like we came in here today we gave you the perspective of how to look at things more globally rather than just looking at numbers right but this kind of knowledge transmission is not happening in the indian or maybe developing economies investor class they still believe that the company has to become profitable if they are owning the shares right so that is that is what is creating an issue but i think we all ought to have to live with it and slowly and gradually the as you were saying regulators are also not starting pushing that and it's good also because ultimately there has to be वैसे डंडा होना चाहिए सर पे तभी आगे बढ़ेंगे वरना वो होगा ही नहीं तो फिर कैसे प्रॉफिट आएगा तो अगर आपका पैसा आता रहेगा और लॉस होता रहेगा लाइक जोमैटो स्टिल हैव अ 9 बिलियन डॉलर इन देयर किटी एंड दे आर स्टिल प्रोजेक्टिंग दैट दे विल बी इन लॉस इन नेक्स्ट 4 इयर्स राइट सो इट्स बिकमिंग अ कैश वर्निंग मशीन नाउ प्लस फॉर राइट क्लास एज अ प्रोफेशनल इट मेक्स मोर सेंस इट इज मोर रेगुलर या 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 सो आई थिंक दैट नाउ द टाइम हैज कम विद इन इंडिया आल्सो आई थिंक द द द द होल स्टार्टअप इकोसिस्टम हैज टू बी रेगुलेटेड but what is happening right now i will just try and spend next 5 7 minutes on that so that you get and get to know what is happening here so in india what is happening is that uh, obviously there was a lot of m and a activity happening and why m and a was happening because we ultimately know that uh, there are people who, there is consolidation that has to happen as i told you earlier also and that's what's leading to m and a where these smaller companies are being bought by the larger companies right and even traditional companies are buying startups because start, what they could not do what is happening in a traditional start traditional companies promoters were traditional mindset they are not able to think like startups so they are not able to build a brand they are not able to build a distribution network they are not able to create a, a kind of a intangible asset that these uh, startups create right so they don't want to get into startup mode but when the startup has made somewhere right they have made some some successful story then all of these people with big pots of money come and say that okay now i want to buy it so that is where the exit is happening right the mna mna exit is coming into play so if we see here uh, 60% of the exits have happened through uh, through mna and 40% has happened through ipo now this ipo is also a recent phenomena uh, before 2021 no ipo was happening at least in india as i'm telling developing your developing economy we take a case example of I <laughs> high profile IPOs have come in 2021 accounting for 5.3 billion of the total value. So these are all the IPOs that have happened uh, in 2021. You can see all of these in 2021, and you can see uh, that most of them had given listing gains. At least listing gains, they were able to generate listing gains for the investors, uh, except PTM and. Uh, Quite a few. So Paytm is another story. I think me and Amish were discussing, and we were predicting that when whenever Paytm's IPO <coughs> will come, market will tank, and that is what happened. Market tank to fifty to fifty. Like in India, I'm talking about Sensex, it went up to fifty thousand again, coming back from sixty to fifty thousand because of Paytm. So I think uh, it 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 again all boils down, and we show this to you through the case studies that we have, and the uh, two or three case studies that we have. We'll take it very quickly. it all completely boils down after a point in time to the unit economics or the kpis that the company <coughs> is generating at least specifically in the developing economies right so if we have taken a case example of ease my trip uh, zomato uh, to show to you that how how that happens but uh, if you see here only nika ease my trip and map my india i think these are the ones who are still generating uh, still trading at the valuation higher than their, their listing price Uh, except them, I think all of them uh, are not not performing well. Uh, so let me talk about Zomato. I think we all know uh, uh, what Zomato is doing. It is a food delivery, dining out, uh, and uh, subscription. So there are different different models that now I, Zomato has come up with. I'll not get into these models. I'll show you some numbers. What is happening here is that, and there is there is also a COVID story in between, right? Because this business was directly impacted. All the restaurants got closed. 
for at least about a year or so, maybe nine months to a year, the restaurant industry was impacted. So therefore, this 2020 <coughs> one number looked distorted. Uh, but again, uh, so what is what is happening with with Zomato currently is that Zomato's IPO price was 72, last unit price is 62. It went up to about 150. It came down. Market cap of 6.66 billion. Uh, Price to sales ratio 14.77 against the price to sales ratio at, at IPO of 19.37. And uh, these are the growth ratios. Now, what is happening is that Zomato's valuation has reduced 50%. Uh, what is causing this? Let us look at that. Zomato has a very strong competition from Swiggy, right? Uh, Amazon Foods are also coming in. Good that they have not come in, otherwise, uh, Zomato would have further tanked. But what is happening here is that there are strong concerns. There are good parts of to Zomato. The good part is that they have got a superior market cap and it enjoys a good uh, consumer confidence. They have got a large network. They are one. They have the worst mover advantage. All of that is there, but there are strong concerns also. Uh, that is where the Zomato is lacking. One is obviously the strong competition. Uh, it has made substantial investments uh, after even after IPO. They have just invested in growers. Though that's a stock deal, but still. Uh, Investor looks at it more from perspective that they have to now load brokers also on their back, right, and and take it ahead. So success of all of these companies uh, that depends upon. <clears throat> then in India, there's lack of clarity on the consumer internet product and services. Like uh, we see that some payment methods are being stopped, Chinese apps are being banned. A lot of things happen in India, so there's issue around that as well. So what has happened is that Zomato's valuation journey has been a roller coaster where it started off and uh, it has now come down. So you can see this price of 167 coming down to 39 at a point in time uh, within a short span of period of what was about a year or so, right? So and currently I think it's trading at, trading at 62. Now this again, uh, what is happening here is that uh, this is a narrative which was given by Professor Damozran at the time of IPO. He told that. Uh, the, the price of the company should be 42, not 72, the IPO price, right? And why he said this is because he did a detailed analysis. So there was a 40, sorry, there was a 400 pager uh, red herring prospectus that Zomato has rolled out, right? And if you want to invest in Zomato, you should have read that 400 pager, which nobody <laughs> us, of us have got the patience. And then we say that why start on losing money? So I think this is also one of the issues that we want to invest money, we want to get returns, but we don't want to make any any analysis, we don't want to do anything ourselves, we just rely on people, right? So, somebody will say that, okay, Zomato shares are going up. I had uh, actually seen this one, if you, I don't know whether you guys, uh, just Paul Bhatti, right? Yeah, just yes, Paul yes, Bhatti yes, flop yes. show. Yes, yes, yes. So, there is an episode, yes, so that is there on the flop show, Pani Puri, Pani Puri, Pani Puri, Pani Puri. where he actually made a Pani Puri guy, a billionaire, by, by coming out with his IPO. So, that is how we all look at startups IPOs, that we will be able to uh, make a lot of money, but Professor Professor Damodaran is somebody who actually went in and did a lot of analysis on uh, how, what should be the real price of uh, Zomato. And at the time the listing was being made, he came out with a price per share of 40, right? Which somewhere I told you that the seat has gone at 39 at a point in time, right? So, so this this is the kind of analysis that he did. So he he actually looked at the market size. And uh, while Zomato was predicting a market as a $40 billion, he said that the market is not $40 billion, it's $25 billion. He also looked at that there will be paucity of restaurants in India due to low per capita GDP. Market penetration, again, uh, Zomato said that it will have 70, 60, 70% market share. But uh, Zomato was not figuring out that there is another uh, competitor in terms of Zomato. And if Amazon Foods would, would have come in, this market should have been even further down. Uber Eats, they were able to make a deal. Otherwise, Uber Eats was also a competition to Zomato. Uh, then business improvements, I think Zomato at that point in time was uh, saying that they will still remain as a food delivery platform. There will be no significant business diversion. It will continue to burn money for at least four years and uh, will continue to suffer losses. So I think these are certain things which, which obviously uh, the Modran took into his analysis. He also did a DCF. Ultimately, because ultimately you cannot come up with a price of 40 rupees for a loss making company in the air. So he did all of his analysis, he did it DCF and all, but he corrected all the assumptions. The market related assumptions like your serviceable market, your team who are backing that, what is the 
uh, size at which they will be doing, what is the per capita income, what is the amount of fee that Zomato will be able to charge. So all of the assumptions were tested and that is how he came up with a price of 40 against 70, which is actually the case, right? So if you now look at some of the financial performance of Zomato, you will get, get, get to the answers also that why the price is not going up. Right? So we all are seeing that the price is now not at all going up. What is happening here is that as the Zomato has achieved a scale, uh, the uh, sales are not going up. In this last last four quarters, if you see, they are not going at a rate at which they were growing earlier when they were looking at June 20. Right? So average quarterly revenue growth rate is 24%, but against this, expenditure rate is also 22%. So there is hardly any cash left in the system. To for the growth, for the future growth. They have to either raise money or use the money that they raise in the IPO. Right? So Zomato's expenditures are higher than revenue, broadly growing with a similar quarterly growth rate. And again, if you see here, this monthly transacting users are also not growing. They're also stagnant. So I know what happened here is that since they have putting they're putting less money in, uh, in acquiring customer, that has become stable because of which the uh, the revenue has become stable and the value has also become stable. <coughs> so this is how the, this metric is. Now, now in contrast to this Zomato situation, look at EaseMyDev. Now this is not a very new business that, that somebody is getting listed. Right? We, we have Make My Trip, we have got Yatra, we have got Musafir, we have got plenty of online travel aggregator, right? But still this company has been able to come up with an IPO and been able to sustain the IPO and it is generating returns for the investors. The only reason why it has been able to do this is because it has been generating profits. Uh, the uh, If you look at this chart, see here, it's gone up to 475. Why? Because there is an upfront trend to sales growth. Expenditure is far, far behind the sales. Growing per capita income of Indians and growing popularity of low cost airlines. Right? This is the booking success rate and it has actually been able to generate profits, at least at the unit economics level. What is what is the problem with Zomato is that at the unit economics also they have not been able to showcase how they will be able to make money in future. So now key performance indicators and unit economics is becoming a, a, a thing to watch for. This is one thing that we want to show to you is that even Investors know that they should not want to put in money in any business model which is not worth putting, right? So it's not that every every Tom, Dick, and Harry is getting getting money, right? You look at WeWork. A lot of hype was created around 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 WeWork. What and they never the IPO never came. They had to actually got it listed through SPAC, and uh, current valuation also below the value at which they got listed, right? So what happened with WeWork is that uh, the the CEO, which is Adam Newman, they, he created a lot of hype about the business. But ultimately, people were able to realize there is no technology play in this business. It is a pure, simple real estate business uh, wherein they are just leasing out the office spaces and there is nothing more to it that they are doing. And the flaws were, were being able to identify very quickly where they had they had actually long leases and short rentals. right? So you have to commit a lot of capital into the long leases and they were what they were doing is they were made to make it lavish, they were also modernizing it. There were a lot of capex being incurred. So which made the business very unattractive, there were huge losses. So Morgan Stanley at some point in time had valued uh, at 100 billion, I don't know how, <laughs> but they did. So there was some kind of story being sold to them by, by the CEO. So they valued, but quickly, I think uh, there was sanity and uh, SoftBank, I think uh, 47 billion is what SoftBank had put in, but they never put in the money. So they, they just put in the number. I don't think that they had put in any great amount of money in this business. <coughs> They put money, they not they put the not money, the not very very significant amount of money they did not put. So uh, and then there was a decline in value in September and IPO was postponed up to nine billion, right? Uh, ten billion and then at nine bill uh, at nine million the expect IPO came in and the current value is two billion. So this is what happens when your business model is not as strong and you pro you project it to be strong. Now some of the concluding remarks. Uh, we all should understand that the biggest reason tech companies are losing money and there were some questions also around this and why they are losing money and why people are still investing because we all we all have to get ourselves educated that they are young companies trying to take advantage of a market with immense growth potential right so they have to spend money right even the companies who are building infrastructure projects 
spent huge money, right? Does that it's 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 going into the capex? Here it is coming into the PNL, showing as losses. It's the same thing. You have to spend billion of dollars to extract oil, right? And when the oils get extracted, then you become billionaire. So you have to. All of us have to think from that perspective that startups also need their time. IPO as a matter took 13 years to get to the IPO stage. So so that's how it is. Excuse me. Yeah. Is it an accounting issue now that we are all CAs here? Yes, sir. That you just gave an example. Yeah. If somebody is capitalizing the acquisition cost when somebody else is not. Yeah. Is it an accounting issue? No, see, uh, again, depends upon at micro level how do you do the accounting, right? So under IFRS, it says that if you have put your use case into play, so you are generating revenue, and uh, you are modernizing your software and all. So the software cost is still going into the capex only, right? But the money that you are spending on the employees, or you are doing advertisement, or you are making parties, or you are doing trips, travel, and all of that, that may not get into your capex because your product is up and running. You are doing that for sustaining it or doing it. So it's not an accounting issue. Yeah, it's not an accounting issue, but but the only the example why I gave that example is that you have to look at it from that perspective that amount of money has to be spent. Before that startup can become profitable, it can start generating returns for the investor because it has to reach a scale. The unit economics will only work for startups once they reach scale. Mm. That will not work once uh, before they reach a scale. That's how the startup ecosystem is designed to be, right? And that is why they are they are doing something unique, which no traditional company is able to do. So unit economics is very important. Traditional investors and retail investors need to be educated on the dynamic uh, dynamics of startup <coughs> ecosystem. And then at last, I think uh, uh, the company startups also need to put in KPIs uh, to be showcased as a benchmark to support the valuation of startups both pre-IPO and post-IPO stage. So this is all what we had for today. Thanks for being so patient uh, with us and being able to listen to us. Thank you so much. And uh, I think uh, I'll just take one minute more. There's a lot of more, lot more to valuation than the startup valuation. I think uh, there is a lot of uh, different classes of shares. In which the investments happen in different uh, companies, so there are complex valuation analytics that is happening now in the developed world and developing world, which includes your option pricing model like binomial, Monte Carlo's, Black Shows of the world. So we do all of that, and I would request maybe uh, you guys to invite us again to be able to educate <laughs> maybe something on that also. Maybe some time later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bender. Today we had a long evening, but it was worth it. Thank you to Asma sir, Bender and Amrish. I mean, what uh, Rajkumar sir started and how uh, Bender and Amrish said, I mean, it reminds me of a quote, the size of your dreams must always exceed your current capacity to achieve them. If your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. So thank you for reinforcing all this throughout the evening. I will not take much time, uh, I had done a lot of, but I start reading those and we banned from the event going forward. So in the interest of dinner and time, uh, may we request Rajkumar sir to felicitate our speakers. Encyclopedia on valuation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and your valuation is priceless. Yes. <laughs> so with that, uh, so we'll do, we'll take a group picture now. So we'll just sit at our own place, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe just a little bit come closer so that we are in one group. Okay.